Today's conversation is sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. It amazes me how many people don't understand the asset that they're investing in, and it drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to ask, what is it that I'm investing in? Frankly, like Bitcoin and some of those other things, they really perplex me because I I don't know. Can you explain that to your mother-in-law, like what you're investing in? You're listening to the Going Long Podcast with Billy Keels, the number one podcast for long distance real asset investing. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And guess who I am? Yes, I'm your host, Billy Keels, and I am super excited to welcome you back to yet another amazing conversation. Today is really, really, really well, this is one that you're really going to like because the me and the guest, like we talk about something that is very, very dear to our heart. And I know it's going to be very dear to your heart. And wow, you're going to get into that in just a little bit because I've got to share a couple things with you. Guess what? We continue to move up the charts together. Yes, we are. So phenomenal, phenomenal. Really appreciate that. And most importantly, appreciate you for continuing to be here to download the episodes, to share them, to talk about them. And also for those of you who have taking the time to leave an honest written review as well as a rating. If you've not had a chance to do that again, or you've not had a chance to do that yet, go ahead, just uh, leave us a nice, uh, honest written review as well as rating. Would really appreciate that because we get your feedback. We know what you like, what you'd like to see changed. And most importantly, it helps us to also attract the guests that are giving you the inputs and the thoughts that you need to go out and take action and get closer to your goals much faster that stated as well. I know a lot of you are like, Billy, these episodes are so amazing and I want to go see some of the, I want to listen to the previous ones. I want to watch them. Don't worry. Go to billykills.com. When you get to billykills.com, you will see a tab that changes. The screen changes a little bit and you're going to see a tab, which is podcasts. Go to the podcast tab and you will see every single episode from the very beginning. Like, oh, more than 200 of them. Go there, check it out. It will be awesome. With that stated, today's conversation is really, really cool. There is no one path to your personal freedom. Uh, it can be multifaceted and typically it's has, well, there will be many real assets of, as part of your multifaceted plan. Today's guest is going to talk to you about what can happen even if the your boss comes up to you and says you're fired, there's still life after that. So today's conversation that we're going to have with Tom Dunkel is going to give you insights into that and it's going to be absolutely awesome. We're going to get to that just after this. So if you want to learn how a multifaceted real estate investment approach can help you to secure your long distance investing success, then guess what? Today's the conversation you're going to want to listen to until the very, very, very last word, I promise. You know why? Because today's guest not only has an extensive background in corporate finance, he has 25 plus years of real estate as well as investing experience and his financial savvy as well as communication style has helped him build at least one, probably many of them, uh, of his businesses just from a startup to a world-class organization. And today he is the managing director of Bellrose Storage Group. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Tom Dunkel. Tom, welcome to the show, man. Billy, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Man, it is a pleasure to be here. I am so fired up and looking forward to the entire Going Long family learning so much from you. You've done so many things like buku things, and I'm really, really, really excited for them to learn from you. So, Tom, you know, I'd like to, I like to ask everybody at least five questions. You're going to get two in the beginning. You're going to get three in the end, and then you're going to get a whole bunch of questions in between. I just don't know what those questions are yet. So sure. the thing is, I'm ready for us to get started. So are you ready? Absolutely. I got my favorite, I got my favorite shirt on. I'm ready to go. There you go. There you go. So (laughs) by the way, everybody, if you're not watching the video version, this is a great version time to go check out Tom's cool shirt. Right. Um, So listen, so help us understand Tom, where are you, uh, where do you live in the U S? Yeah. So I'm in a town called Wayne, Pennsylvania, and uh, it's about 15 miles outside of Philadelphia to the West. Uh, So it's, uh, it's uh, in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Great spot. Uh, Beautiful day out here today, here in the springtime. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Appreciate that, Wayne, mm-hmm. Wayne, Pennsylvania. And help us another thing. Uh, help us understand something else as well, Tom. What's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last twenty four hours? Uh, well, if you'd give me a little grace here to maybe extend it uh, a little longer than twenty four hours, yeah, that's I was fine. At, go ahead, go ahead. Go I was ahead. at. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. I had a great weekend. I was uh, I was out in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, for the Kenny Chesney concert uh, out there, and uh, he is. Uh, for those who don't know, he's a he's a kind of a he's 
classified as a country artist, but he's really kind of a country and rock and roll. And uh, so we, we had a great time out there and uh, we were right up on the stage and it was just a really super fun, energizing uh, kind of experience. Uh, I'm a, I actually am a little bit of a musician myself. So I, I love being up close and personal with mm. those great artists. Fantastic, man. And St. Louis is one of my old stomping grounds. I lived there for about five, a little over five years. So it's a a great place, especially this time of year. You can get out and especially if you're a wonderful concert. So appreciate you sharing that with us. And I've got to kind of tell you a secret, Tom. So the entire Going Long family knows that I try to do this like every single conversation. Like I I like to keep the bar pretty high. Well, not pretty high, very high. And so Mm -hmm. I give myself these challenges. And like one of the challenges, I try to tell your backstory in like two okay. and a half seconds, in two and a half seconds, right? That's impossible. Okay. I, I can never do that. But it's right. one of these kind of things. I always try to push myself to the limit. And sure. so they they forgive me every conversation because they know that I can't do that. It's almost impossible. You've done way too many yep. things, impacted way too many lives, <laughs> but they forgive me. So hopefully you'll forgive me. And also you can help me. Number one, by making sure that you tell your backstory in your own words, number one. And then number two, sure. to help me and the Going Long family, if you could talk to us about some of the major decisions that you made to get to this point in your journey, and then we'll see where you and I uh, take the conversation until we get to the Going Long final three. Sure. Sounds great. Over to you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, appreciate again being on the show today. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned in the intro, I, I have a background in corporate finance and mergers and acquisitions. I'm one of those annoying uh, MBA guys that, you know, ask all the questions and, you know, run the nerdy Excel models and that sort of thing. So I I did that for a number of years. I worked with some fantastic people um, in the aerospace and defense industry and software and technology. And, um, and so I ended up uh, after, uh, after uh, starting out down in the Washington DC area, I moved back home here to the Philadelphia area and I was with a company called Nutrisystem, uh, which some folks might know is a weight uh, weight loss company. And uh, so, in April of 2006, about uh, 16 years ago, uh, my boss, uh, who was the CFO, uh, said something very interesting uh, to me. He said, "You're fired." Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, that was honestly uh, turned out to be the best day of my life because I. Uh, uh, it was a kick in the pants that I needed to go out and finally do something on my own, which I had been wanting to do uh, mm-hmm. for some time. Uh, now, of course, 2006, uh, as some might remember, was kind of the beginning of the financial crisis and the, mm-hmm. and the real estate crisis uh, here in the U.S., which I guess ultimately rippled out across the globe. Yep. But uh I, I I was a vice president at Nutri System, so when I left, I did have a little stockpile of cash that I was able to use, and I'd always wanted to be in real estate. So I I jumped into real estate. Uh, I figured, hey, this is going to be uh, this is going to be easy. You know, I've got an <laughs> MBA from a great school. I've 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 got training from you know Harvard MBAs and and Wharton MBAs and all these fantastic people. I'm going to go out. I'm going to crush this thing. Right. Well. Hmm. You know, fast forward a few years, um, I'm now uh, negotiating with creditors <laughs> to pay off, uh, you know, less than what's owed on some of my debts and, uh, you know, have all kinds of, you know, battle scars uh, from from that period of time. Uh, but it did, uh, it did uh, you know, teach me some very hard early lessons. Um, but Billy, probably the, you mentioned decisions, uh, probably the most uh, compelling decision that I made during that time uh, uh, when I did, when I got fired from Nutrisystem, I, I was looking for entrepreneurial things to do, but I was also looking uh, for another job because I did. Uh, I had a f- young kids at home and wife, and I had to, you know, make sure I was bringing home the bacon. Yeah. So I was, I was, I went through a series of interviews with a, uh, a large global company um, in the textile industry, and they were looking for a global mergers and acquisitions guy and. So if you if you looked at everything on paper, I mean, you would have been like, "Oh, this is the perfect job for Tom." It's you know, it's global. It's a cool. step up. It's it's you know, it's it's advancement. It's you know, a growing company with basically unlimited capital. And uh, wow, what a great opportunity! This is a no brainer, right? Yeah. So I'm in like, I think it was probably the third or fourth interview, and I distinctly remember I was across the table from the guys interviewing with. Super great gentleman. And 
but I just heard this voice in the back of my head. I mean, I literally heard the voice in the back of my head saying, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. You, you, this is not the path for you. Don't do it. So I left the interview. I went home. I called the recruiter. I said, I want you to pull my name from consideration. Wow. And this was a big job. I mean, lots of money, lots of incentives, lots of bonus, lot, you know, lots of, lots of, lots of, you know, pre IPO, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. I said, I want you to pull my name from consideration. He's like, you know, you're their guy, right? I was like, what? He's like, you know, they want you. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I can't, I said, I can't do it. I, I got, I got to go, you know, chart my own course. Mm. So that was a big decision uh, that I, I don't regret um, mm. because it, it set me on this different path. And even though I got the crap beat out of me over the next few years, just learning those hard lessons during the, uh, the financial crisis, um, it forced me to, to, you know, firm up my spine and re, you know, resolve to continue and do better and learn mm. and grow. And, and so I did that. I, I, so when my real estate, uh, portfolio crashed and burned, um, I had to find something else to do. So that's when I found uh, distressed mortgage debt. Mm. So I started buying these, uh, with the few bucks that I had left, I started buying these, uh, distressed mortgages. And for folks who out there who might not know what that is, um, when someone goes into default and they can't pay their mortgage, um, the uh, bank that has their loan, they're, they're under a lot of scrutiny from regulators, right? So regulators do not like to see that a bank is holding on to uh, these, what they call non-accrual assets, right? So these are bad loans. And they got to get them off their books. So what they do is they package these up, they package up these loans and they sell them out into the world. And so a company like ours can end up buying those uh, either through an intermediary or direct from a bank. And, uh, and then we do, we buy them at a deep discount. So then we can do a discounted uh, payoff with the borrower and still make money. We can do a loan modification. Uh, basically, we want to find out what the borrower wants to do, right? Mm -hmm. So we ask them three questions. What happened? Where are you now? What do you want to do? And so we listen to their story. And unlike the bank, being an entrepreneurial organization, we have a lot of different levers we can play with. And we have a lot of different ways where we can come up with a, um, uh, a workout plan uh, for that borrower. Because most times borrower wants to stay in their house. Um, yeah. And they have, they, we have uh, you know, as a math guy, right. I, I can do the math and see, well, Jesus loan, you know, they're underwater, but the borrower, they have what we call emotional equity, right? Mm, so it's, yeah. it's more than the math, right? It's, it's that yeah. their kids go to school around the corner. They go to church down the street. They're best friends with all the neighbors. So they want to stay. Plus there's yeah. just the stigma, right? So yeah. they, they really want to, they really want to make it work. So, uh, so we've been in that business now for 12 years. It's been a, it's been a very lumpy kind of run. It's been mm -hmm. a great run, but it's been lumpy. Okay. So along the way, we're always looking for different uh, opportunities to try to smooth out uh, those spikes. And so we've done hard money lending. We've done, uh, we've done a little bit of fixing and flipping residential houses. Uh, we did pick up a, an Airbnb short-term rental portfolio. Um, but our main focus right now is self-storage. Uh, okay. it's, a, it's a fantastic industry, and I'm sure we'll get more into that. But that's, uh, that's kind of how I ended up here today. Yeah, so and appreciate you sharing that, really giving us a, a, a real understanding of kind of where you, where you started, some of the things that happened to you um, and, and happened for you at the same time um, that, that we'll come back to that. Cause one of the things that I believe happened for you is something that happens to many people that are watching and or listening to us today. And I, I know that they can learn a lot from, from what you went through um, and really being able to look at different opportunities that were in the marketplace. And, and once again, even going back to what we talked about today, like how you take a multifaceted approach to be able to solve problems, to ultimately help to move forward in, in the, in the long distance investing success. Right. Mm -hmm. There was one thing that you said that, it just, I mean, it struck a chord in my heart because I have lots of conversations, right? And you and I were talking about this earlier that I, you know, just recently am no longer part of the corporate world. It's been about four months, something like that. And 
you said something that I hope that the entire Going Long family heard you say, which was, it was something that probably should have happened when that boss of yours, that CFO came in and gave you those kind of contracted three words into two, which is you're fired. <laughs> and so, and, and also because I think that happens to a lot of people. And most recently, even after people have been locked in the houses for such a long time over the last couple of years, but what was it before we even start talking about the real assets and stuff, what is it that you do you believe now, because you can look at it with some perspective that just kind of kept you in that job rather than saying, I know something else out here is greater waiting for me that I should be doing that I could be making mm -hmm. more impact because you didn't say that you were dejected or, or downtrodden when, when the CFO said you're fired, you said, wow, it should have happened. Maybe you can talk to us that kind of about that, what you've learned since then that was keeping you in that job rather than becoming the best you possible. Sure. Uh, you know, I think part of it, Billy, was that um, I, I needed to mature some more. Um, and I did have responsibilities at home. Uh, so in 2006, my kids were uh, four and two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so very, very young. Yeah. So I needed to, you know, make sure that they were taken care of. Um, but leading up to that, I think I was just wanting to gather as much experience and be around the best people that I could be around and just glean whatever I could from them. And, and I, I didn't quite have a, a plan for when I was going to go out and do my own thing. So the fact that I did get the boot was, uh, was just exactly what I needed, but uh, I'm, re I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but can you <laughs> sure. just repeat what you just said? Cause I, it, it, I, I love what you just said about the plan. Can you, can mm -hmm. you repeat that please? Sure. Uh, well, I think what I said was I, I didn't really have a plan. <laughs> that, 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 that's exactly it. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Cause, cause we're gonna, and, 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 and Tom, I love that you share that because mm. we hear so many times that people are like, Hey, I had this master plan and I was going to be doing all this stuff and I was going to be moving to this. But a lot mm -hmm. of times, and I relate to that, Tom, mm -hmm. many times we are performing at the best of our ability, but we are just looking what's the next step, but there's not really mm -hmm. a clear plan. And just because, and this is really for the person that's watching us and listening to us today, if you feel like that's you, it's mm -hmm. okay. Like uh, eventually sure. that will change. You don't have to have a master plan in your life to feel like you will become what you need to be. So I'm, I'm sorry to stop you while you were in the middle of the flow, but it's just like, nobody, <laughs> no. like so few people say that, Tom. And it's like, no. yes, yes, I said it. <laughs> no, I, um, no, thank you, Billy. I, I think, um, I, you know, and I think that's still kind of true today, um, not to totally go off the rails here, but, you know, we've, we've always uh, built our businesses, you know, wanting to have certain optionality, right? Because, you know, we're in self-storage today, but, you know, maybe self-storage isn't where it's at, you know, a couple of years from now. So we need yeah. to be able to stay agile and, and, and see those opportunities and not be so focused on this, that we miss this cool thing over here that, that Love might it. be better and faster and juicier. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think that's just part of our, uh, corporate DNA here is, is we we're, we're agile. We're looking for those opportunities, uh, cause we're investors ourselves. So, you know, it's, it's not always going to be the, you know, the tech stocks, it's not always going to yep. be, you know, the, uh, commodities, it's got, you know, we're, we're, it's, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stay open. You gotta, you gotta go for it, but then you gotta stay open and to other opportunities as well. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. So appreciate you sharing that. And then also to sure. one of the other things that, and I know we talked about this before, which is kind of the genesis of this show, which is me living, taking it to a super extreme, right? Cause I'm living mm -hmm. over here in Europe <laughs> and mm -hmm. investing exclusively in the United States. But so mm -hmm. many of the books that I, when I started going down the rabbit hole of, wow, I love real estate and it's amazing and da, da, da. And I've since realized very much like you, it's not just about real estate. It is about what is the particular uh, service or product that can help to solve my problem. And whether that is mm -hmm. energy equipment, whether that is real estate, whether, or meaning self-storage, or it could be something else, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things there. But most things said you have to live in the place where you actually are making your investments. I fundamentally don't believe that. I believe that's something that you and I also have in common. So, but, but what is it that has allowed you to say, okay, we're really going to not let geography be a, a, a defining characteristic of what we do. And we're mm -hmm. going to be able to go long distance. We're going to also have help other people that are maybe living today in St. Louis, but there's an opportunity that you and your company are investing in, in Miami, and they just haven't felt 
you know, just as an example, but mm -hmm. I think it goes to the, to the character of the company, the culture to say, Hey, look, we can be contrarian and we don't actually just have to do things that are right in our backyard. Talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. Uh, sure, Billy. I think I think it goes back to what I said a minute ago, which is uh, you need to you need to remain flexible and you need to be willing to go where the opportunities are. Um, so, for example, I'm here outside the Philadelphia area, but we don't buy storage up here because the demographics and the market characteristics that we look for don't exist here right now. So that's why we're buying our self storage facilities in the southeastern U.S. because that's where the people are moving, that's where the jobs are being created, that's where the wealth is going. You know, yeah. so th those are the things that we look at. And and Billy, this is something we learned early on too. Uh, when uh, after the the real estate market crash, and I had to reinvent and got into distressed mortgage debt. Well, those first couple loans I bought, they were in uh, they were on they were uh, mortgages on houses uh, in. Uh, in Texas mm -hmm. and uh, Alabama. And so, and then now we're buying pools of loans. You know, now we buy hundreds of loans, if not thousands of loans at a time. They're all over the place. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we got over that real quick because we saw the opportunity. And uh, actually, I have to say, you know, just the fact that we're speaking together right now and you're in Barcelona and I'm in Wayne, I mean, technology has, yeah. has played a huge part, right? Because I can go on Google Earth and I can walk, I can virtually, you know, walk around a self-storage yeah. facility or the house that we have a, a, a mortgage note on. Yeah. And, uh, and we can use those resources to, you know, make it feel as close as we can to being there. And, uh, and so I think we, we've, we relied on technology, rely on the, the databases and the, the subscription services that we use to get the best information that we can get. And then we just compile all that together and we make a decision. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate how you were able to break that down for us, really being flexible, looking for the opportunities, allowing your systems to be in place and working and also technology. You know, one of the things you know, who's been doing this for whatever, 10 years, long distance, long, long distance, intercontinental, as most people would say. <laughs> and I guess one mm -hmm. of the things that's also, I'm sure you've seen this, that others that were maybe a little bit on the laggard side of things, they've recognized that, hey, listen, if I had to be locked in my home for the last year and a half or two years or whatever it is, I didn't want my capital to stop moving. So I was making investments and they and somehow started realizing, wow, technology can actually help me to make mm -hmm. these better business or investing decisions or whatever the case may be, or FaceTime or Zoom or Teams and all of these types of things. So mm -hmm. it is one of the byproducts that has helped, I believe, people to mm -hmm. feel more comfortable being able to leverage technology um, mm -hmm. to live their best lives. So, so another thing that, and, and I know you're, because we have a lot of really high paid, a lot of IT sales professionals busy sure. uh, that want to do something different and, and they're feeling like sometimes things are just not really all of that um, sometimes safe. So they come back here and they want to listen and they want to learn about things that are, are going on <laughs> in terms of being able to make investment decisions. Mm -hmm. I know that you have this whole thing about things being unsafe and safe, and you've got a philosophy <laughs> on that and a thought process. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what does safe mean to you when I talk about that from an investing perspective? Sure. Uh, thanks for teeing that up, Billy. Let me, let me see if I can knock this one out of the park, but no, thank you. So we, we have developed over the years uh, an, an investment due diligence platform that we call uh, SAFE Investing. And SAFE is an acronym. So the S stands for sponsor, the A stands for asset, the F stands for financials, and the E stands for exit. So I would invite everyone to go to our website. It's you don't have to give us your name or email or anything. You can just go to our homepage and go to the bottom, and the and the, our safe method uh, ebook is available uh, for everyone. It's at uh, www.bellrosestoragegroup.com. Hopefully, Billy, that'll be in the. It will be in the show in the, notes. In the show notes. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Thank you so, so much. So don't worry if you're running on the treadmill, you're freaking out or you're driving the car. <laughs> don't worry, everybody. Right. Don't, it, we'll make it real simple. It'll be one yeah. click. So re really what it is, it's, a, it's kind of a glorified uh, PowerPoint presentation. But basically, these this is an amalgamation of uh, not only some of the things I've learned positively over the years, but some of the things I've learned negatively, the mistakes that I've made. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, you know, we we realize uh, that 
investors, you know, it's easy to get caught up and just, you know, go to Schwab.com and click, click, click. You can buy your, you know, shares of Apple or your favorite mutual fund or whatever it is. So they, they make it very easy to do that. Mm-hmm. Stepping out into the alternative investment world, uh, such as investment uh, syndications for real estate deals, self storage, apartments, what have you. Uh, it's it's a it's a leap, right? So uh, you know, no one really teaches how to how to how to do your due diligence and get comfortable. So that's what this book is for. It's for the busy professional that needs that framework. They 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 need that framework to to get comfortable and make that step into alternative investments. I've been doing it since two thousand six. And I, I haven't looked back uh, because the the returns that I make in alternative investments, secured in most cases by real estate, you know, there's cash flow, there's tax advantages. I mean, it, to me, it blows away uh, what can happen. Uh, with, you know, the investment op- options on Wall Street. That's just me. Yeah. Um, so, S, I'll just go through this quickly, Billy. If that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you go right in. So, S is for sponsor. So, sponsor is who's running the deal. So who's taking your money and what are they doing with it? And what's their background? Uh, what is their experience? You know, where do they live? Is it, a, is it just one person? Is it a whole team? You know, what, what, is this, what does this entity look like? Um, is, is it you know, so-and-so at gmail.com asking you to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars? That's probably going to be a red flag, right? <laughs> at least, at least have a good email address. Yeah. So anyway, the the essay just gives a, a list of questions, and it's certainly not exhaustive, but it's just to get your mind going. You know, what has their track record been? You know, what's their background? Have have they been in this asset class for a while? Um, are they guaranteeing anything? Um, and that's you know, that's you're not going to find that in a private placement situation, but you might find that. In a lending situation, if you're making a loan, uh, if you're if you're making a first position mortgage loan on, a, say, a rehab property, you might be able to get the sponsor to personally guarantee uh, that investment. In a private placement deal like we put together, we don't guarantee. We do a lot of other things, but we we don't guarantee that. That's more of a, an equity investment. Yeah, if, you uh, see, so if you see, if you sorry to cut you off, but if sure. you see a, if you see a guarantee in a in a PPM, you. you may need to ask yourself a couple of questions and maybe even potentially run the other way. Um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So I, I appreciate you talking about that. So sorry, yeah. we were at S and we were on, sure. on our way to the asset, I think. Yes, we were. So, so uh, just to finish off S, yep. the, the ultimate question you want to ask yourself is, can I sleep well at night knowing that this person has my money? So, so okay. <laughs> so, no, so you have to check out the art. The, you have to yeah. see the video version, the video. everybody, because yeah. I'm just excited. As soon as he said that, so one of the things that I talk about here <laughs> constantly, constantly, yeah. constantly, constantly, Tom is there is one metric that I believe nobody talks about enough, and it is one that I am on. Whether it, I'm on this side of the microphone or the other side of the microphone, the one metric that is the single most important metric for anyone in investing. It beats IRR, it beats COC, it beats NPV, it beats them all. It is ROS. And if your ROS is positive, then that's a good thing. If it's the ROS is negative, it doesn't matter what the return is. And the ROS is your return on sleep. Because if your return (laughs) on sleep is negative and it's giving you the projected highest triple, quadruple digit returns ever, it's not worth it because nothing Mm -hmm. is worth a bad night's sleep. Nothing. So I'm just so I get all excited. Like, oh, this, wow. So it's just great. Well, Billy, I, I hope that's not copyrighted because I'm stealing that from it, you. It, I'm going to use it, that. It is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, was... yeah, but it's, but yeah, I mean, it, it, but it is one of those things that I think it's the best. Um, it is. It's just uh, sure. our, uh, the, the sleep. The, 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 but people don't think about it enough. And I love that you talk about it, Tom, because it is, mm-hmm. it is just really, really important um, sure. to be able to sleep well at night and get the questions answered from the sponsor. So. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, so moving on to A. So A is for asset, right? It amazes me how many people don't understand the asset that they're investing in and it drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to ask, what is it that I'm investing in? This is why, frankly, like Bitcoin and some of those other things, they really perplex me because 
I, I don't know. Can you explain that to your mother-in-law, like what you're investing in? It, it drives me a little nuts. But you know, what is the asset? Are you buying membership interests in an LLC that's buying a self-storage facility? If, you, if you're involved in one of our syndications, that's what, that's what you're doing. You're buying membership interests in an LLC that owns the property. Uh, so that's pretty simple. Uh, but you want to know, you know, where is the asset for, for folks uh, over in Europe? Are you comfortable investing in a self-storage facility uh, in Georgia? H- hopefully, because that's mm. where some of the good deals are these days. That's where, that's where some of the serious growth markets are these days or in the southeastern United mm. States. Um, so there's a whole series of questions just about the asset that you're investing in. And I, d- and I do have one in there about, you know, can you explain it to your kids? <laughs> can you explain it to someone that doesn't know investing? Because then, you know, it helps you solidify in your head what it is you're investing in. And then, of course, the, the, the final question is, can you sleep at night knowing that your money is tied up in this asset? Uh, moving on to F, the financials. So financials is, you know, what are the projections? Do they look reasonable? Has the sponsor performed this way in the past? Uh, what are the, some of the tax implications of this investment? How much of your personal net worth are you tying up in this investment? If it's too much or in this in particular investment or this asset class, you might want to rethink that. Uh, so there's a whole series of questions about that. And then ultimately... You can guess what the final question is. <laughs> can you sleep at night understanding in your own head what the financial aspects are of this investment opportunity? Yeah. And then lastly is E, which is for exit. So you can't go online to schwab.com and click, 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 sell your uh, membership interests in the, in the self-storage facility that, that you've invested in with us. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You, so you need to know what is the exit strategy. Uh, has the sponsor per, uh, performed this way in the past? Uh, is do I what control do I as the investor have over that? You know, a lot of times in a syndication, you really don't have any. So you need to be comfortable with that going in that your money is going to be tied up for two, three, four. I've seen uh, uh, syndications as long as ten years. Mm-hmm. You need to be comfortable with that. Um, and so you need to understand, you know, what, what is the trigger for that exit? Is it the sale of the property? Is it the refinancing of the property? Uh, is it a recapitalization of the property? So you need to understand all of those exit uh, items. And so the, 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 the safe ebook goes through all those questions. And as you can guess, the final question is, <laughs> can you sleep well at night? Understanding, you know, that your money's tied up for this period of time and, and that you understand the exit strategies associated with this investment opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, in a nutshell, uh, that's the safe method, Billy. Well, I appreciate you breaking down the safe method. And I love the fact that we are so aligned in terms of, well, can you sleep well? Because look, <laughs> right. I don't sleep very much, Tom. I sleep very little, but the very little I sleep, I like sleeping very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a so, fan of sleep too. I think yeah, maybe yeah. that's why I came up with this. <laughs> Um, so listen, so I do want you to uh, just to kind of talk to us at a high level um, from the from the perspective of, of self-storage, right? And then after this, we really want to get us into the going long final three. But so I know you, although you're multifaceted, there is a, a focus that, you're, that your company has made uh, in the area of, mm-hmm. uh, of self-storage. So maybe talk to us at a high level, you know, wh- what, what drives that? I know it's a lot of being flexible, being adaptable, but right now, what is catching uh, the interest to continue to move you towards um, sure. closer to our self-storage? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a handful of, of, of things. Uh, really, it's, it's that it's a real asset, right? This is a real asset and Generally, real assets can't go to zero, so we we really do like that. Um, it's a cash flowing asset. So, and not only is it cash flowing, it's cash flows at a pretty high yield because uh, the operating expenses at a self storage facility are typically around you know thirty ish percent, meaning that the net operating income is seventy percent. So that gives a lot of margin. So you know we're heading into some headwinds right now, Billy, with yeah. you know uncertainty about the economy and inflation and interest rates, et cetera. Yeah. Self storage over history has been a very, very resilient asset class in uh, you know in among all commercial asset classes. It always performs really well. And that's because 
of uh, people need the storage because of, of the way that their lives are going on, you know, divorce, death, you know, dislocation, all these kinds of things can, can force people into, into needing a self-storage unit. And as operators, you know, we have the ability, you know, if we do get some headwinds, uh, some are saying, you know, late next year, maybe recession, we, have, we could adjust our rates uh, because we do have that margin to play with, so I, I really like that, and we'll and we'll still be able to service our our debt and our investors. So that we really really like that. And then uh, probably the last thing I sort of jumbled a few things together there, but the, probably the last thing. Uh, I mean, there's plenty more, but the last one I'll highlight is uh, self storage is becoming a lot more mainstream. Mm. The early generations of self storage, it was you know some rusty old boxes in the back of an industrial area that, you know, nobody really knew it was back there. Uh, but today you're finding old Sears stores, uh, old Kmart stores, these big box stores, Best Buy. You're seeing a lot of these big box stores being converted into self-storage because uh, here in the U.S., and I imagine it's the same elsewhere, uh, it's really the uh, the lady of the house, the, the woman in the house is making a lot of the buying decisions and she doesn't want to go back to the rusty, dirty, dusty old uh, industrial complex. She wants it to be uh, around the corner from the school on the way to the grocery store around those uh, you know, convenience areas. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing self-storage facilities uh, now pop up in those, in those areas and they're very well lighted. They have security cameras, you know, there's some curb appeal, those kinds of things. Uh, so that it's becoming a lot more institutional, a lot more mainstream, and especially with millennials uh, that are buying smaller homes, they're staying in apartments longer, but they still want their toys. So they, they're storing their, uh, their kayaks and bikes and holiday decorations and all those sorts of things, not as an afterthought, but as an overall uh, housing plan for themselves. So that's the big trend that we're seeing now, because there's more millennials now than any other generation uh, alive right now. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you giving us that high level um, uh, understanding as to why the continued focus, um, the, the fact that it is a real asset, it provides you know, con consistent cash flow. You have margin, which I like that you, you highlighted that to be able mm -hmm. to think about the downside risk in the event and when, not, not in the event, but when things uh, begin mm -hmm. to go a little bit south, you give you uh, the opportunity to protect your investors, uh, protect the asset as well. So, um, mm -hmm. And hey, listen, if millennials are there, then hey, listen, there's probably going to be a, a, a lot of a, a lot of um, demand. So, yes. but the thing is, Tom, like these conversations fly by. We got to get to the going long final three. I know, man. I it's know. time for the going long final three. I can't believe it. Like, I, I want to keep, we got on, we were like know. yelling on the sleep thing. So I'm like, hang I, on a second. I know. As usual, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I tend to, yeah, be very long winded. So I apologize. But. No, not at all. We could talk about this for forever and ever. Um, but so here's the thing. So we started with you over in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And although I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, this is like now my adopted side of the pond, so to speak. So I happen to know that you're a pretty big world traveler, but uh, I'll leave it there. So this is going to be really easy for you. Mm -hmm. So the question for you, the first the going along final three is really help us understand what is your favorite European city that you have either visited or is still on your bucket list to visit? Uh, sure. And uh, uh, not saying this just because you're there, but I've been to Barcelona twice and I absolutely loved it. I think Barcelona uh, is a great town, uh, fantastic food. Uh, I, I love, and I love the, uh, the different parts of town. So you've got the Bari Gatik, right? You've got the, oh, the, the, the older good. part of town <laughs> and then, wow. but then you've got the more modern side of town and I, and I, and then, uh, just the great, uh, uh, you know, sightseeing and, and the, uh, the architecture there is really interesting, but I do have to, I do have to throw in a tie for a uh, tie okay, for first okay. place okay. for me, uh, would be Florence, Italy. Florence. I think. You is can it? even go with Florence, by the way. If you want to go with Florence, you, you're allowed <laughs> I, uh, to go with Florence. <laughs> I wasn't going. I'm honest. I wasn't you're, going you're with fine. Barcelona just because you're there. But uh, no, I thought Florence uh, was was just a, another beautiful city. I love the museums there. Uh, in fact, I'm dying to get back there. I have not been there in some time, but I'd love to get back. Well, I'm sure Fidense will be waiting for you with open arms, Barcelona as well. So I uh, appreciate you sharing that. The the, the second. Oh, by the way, we're going to have to decide. I don't know which one we're going to go with, by the way, because you 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 kind of left it there. Are you going to go with okay. Florence or Barcelona? Uh, well, now that you're giving me the option, I might have to go with Munich. I've been to <laughs> Oktoberfest. 
<laughs> I've been to Oktoberfest and it was fantastic. And the parks there are beautiful and the uh, you know the black and spiel too, and all that you're, stuff. You're just too well traveled. So we're gonna go with Munich. We're just gonna we're gonna throw caution to the wind. We're going with Munich. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, so question number two. In in this time, yeah. this is something that you know I really consider myself super fortunate being able to come into contact with so many successful people. And one of the things that I always try to do is just learn as much as possible from successful people. And I consider you to be someone who's also very successful, the number of lives that you impact, the, the constant uh, education that you're helping with others. And so um, hopefully you will agree with me that one of the like one of the things that I've noticed with successful people and one of the reasons that they happen to be so successful is because they, unlike most people, when they have a plan, they put the plan together. They put, they execute the plan. They get things right the first time, and then it allows them to continue to. to um, that's it. I think I was getting. Um, no, it's a joke, Tom. Don't worry. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. This is just an inside joke. It's an inside joke with me and the whole going along family. Everybody, you got to check out the video version because he was like seriously feeling bad for me. He's like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Hey, help him. Help him. No. So it's this is a joke. This is a, it's an inside joke so, because the reality okay. is, Tom, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier, kind of joking, but nobody gets things right perfectly the first time. Like they don't get things right every single time, perfectly the first time. In fact, really successful people, and this is not a joke. The first part was a joke, but this isn't a joke. <laughs> um, really successful people typically make, I think, 20 to 50 times more mistakes than most people. The reality is they do do something that's very, very different, and they do it every single time. Whenever there is a relevant mistake or learning opportunity or whatever word you want to put on it, but when things don't go the way that they were planned, every single time it's relevant, without a doubt, they stop, they learn from the mistake, then they put different strategies, tactics, and actions in place to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening again. I don't want you to think about all the you know thousands of mistakes that you made or learning opportunities that you've had, but if you can think of that one thing, and more importantly, what is the one lesson that you learned from that opportunity that you know that the going long family needs to hear today. What's that one lesson you want to share with us today? Sure. Yeah. And as you mentioned, Billy, there's tons of things that come to mind, but uh, as I'm thinking about this, uh, they all seem to revolve around people. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I tend to be, you know, wanting to see the best in people, wanting to embrace people, wanting to uh, expect the best from people. And sometimes it, it just doesn't work out that way uh, for whatever reason. I mean, there could be a gazillion reasons. Um, but I think, uh, you know, some of the mistakes I've made have been, have been people mistakes, either hiring the wrong person or perhaps partnering with the wrong person. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, as much as that might happen, and the, and the reflection that I do, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm I'm sure that I'm pulling certain lessons from that. But then, you know, there I'll be surprised with something else that uh, comes out of of left field. Uh, and the, but I th I think the thing with people is uh, uh, is they're unpredictable <laughs> a lot of times. Um, so I think. Uh, one thing that we do here uh, at Bellroy Storage Group when we're when we are hiring to try to you know figure out those different facets of the people because uh, of course uh, to, especially today we're in a very competitive environment uh, for hiring talent so mm -hmm. so we make sure uh, we share our core values uh, with our potential candidates and we actually have them give us examples of what. Uh, what they have experienced or what they have done that fits into each one of our five core values. Um, and then we, through the interviewing process, we interview them, hope, if they're local, hopefully we'll interview them in the office. Uh, but then we'll, we'll the, for the next interview, we'll go somewhere else, uh, you know, maybe a, a restaurant, you know, and we'll, we'll see how do they interact with the server? How do they interact with the host? Mm -hmm. How do they interact with the other people? You know, so we try to get a little bit more of a, of an idea of what that person is from, from different perspectives. So I, I think that it, that certainly helps in getting to, to know folks, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, people are funny <laughs> and, uh, and unpredictable. So, but we, we do our best. Okay. So do what you can to, to, to see that you're sharing the core values with those people that you're either going to partner with, that you're going to bring on board, you're going to ultimately do business with. Um, I mean, exactly. it's a, it's a, it's a very similar philosophy. Um, 
Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. Which sure. brings us to the very last of the going along final three, Tom, and that is really about helping us to feed our brain. So what is the one book mm -hmm. that you would recommend to the going along family today? So uh, my favorite book of all time uh, is, is, not a, is not a business book, but it really has a number of lessons that, that translate into business and leadership. And uh, that book is called The Last Place on Earth. Mm. And uh, it is a, a book about uh, the turn of the last century going into the 1900s. And uh, the last place on earth that was yet to be explored was the South Pole. And so it's an adventure book. If you're into like any of the John Krakauer into thin air, you know, climbing Mount Everest type book, it's along those same lines. Um, but what I love about it is, uh, is there's two teams going against each other, right? You have the very well-financed, very arrogant, uh, sorry if there's any uh, British folks out there listening. <laughs> we, we have we have listeners and viewers all over the world, man. <laughs> but but they were, and they 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 had the technology, and they 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 were like, oh, South Pole, no problem. And then on the other side, you've got uh, you've got this uh, Norwegian, you know, basically hippie guy, and he goes and he lives with the Eskimos, and he pulls together the best team that he can. Uh, not only of Norwegians, but I think he's got a couple of Danes in there. And but uh, he's got to go out and raise his money. He's got to go out and convince folks to invest in his project. And uh, he's very disciplined. Uh, he's like, you know, here, here's exactly how our plan is going to go. And it didn't matter if the weather was bad or good or, you know, what uh, obstacles were thrown in front of them. They kind of stuck to that plan and they were able to get not only get to the South Pole, but get everybody home safe. British, not so much. So uh, I think it, there's a lot of great lessons in there for, for leadership and, uh, and business and just, you know, putting a plan together and execution. And I, I think it's uh, not only a fantastic adventure book, uh, but just a great uh, business and leadership book. Fantastic. So we will make sure that we include that as well in the show notes. So the last place on earth mm -hmm. and I cannot even believe, like Tom, seriously, like that time just flies by, like it literally it flies by. Like we're sitting here, we're talking and you're, you know, we're starting in the very beginning and you're sharing with this and you're like, Hey, listen, I, I got these really amazing like words from my boss and it was, <laughs> you're fired. And from that, just the relief that yeah. that allowed you to do to say, okay, well now's the time for me to go out and I'm going to go and I'm going to explore and become the best version of myself, go and really do th some of the things that you wanted to be able to do. You, you got mm -hmm. to the point where you got into your real estate, you got into that textile job. You were, it was like the role that you knew you wanted to be able to do. You got in and it was the next step up, the right compensation, the right benefits, all that stuff. And still something wasn't working. And you just went back and said, no. hey, look, I'm not doing this. This is not the thing. <laughs> something in the back of my mind is telling me, don't do it, don't do it. And you followed your heart, you followed your gut, and you continue to go out and go and really start your new life, right? And being mm -hmm. able to do that, learning what was, was there, staying flexible, staying adaptable, recognizing real assets were a place to be, also recognizing that this dis distressed mortgages was also another place where you could add value being able to mm -hmm. do that in a place where geography is not something that confined you quite the opposite you look for different opportunities mm -hmm. in different places and, and doing that by assets that are backed or sorry in not assets that are back but by with real assets that are always a backstop to what the things that you're doing mm -hmm. not only are you doing that for yourself you're also doing that for investors and you're doing that globally and you're helping them do it in a way that is safe and so that's right. Being safe and is also helping them to make sure that they get a positive ROS return on. That's right. Which is a fantastic <laughs> thing. And I know that so many That's people right. are thinking That's to themselves, right. oh my gosh, you know what? Tom is like, he's like, he really what he's talking about is right up my alley. And they want to find out more about what, how they can get in touch with you, find out more about what it is that you and your, and your group are doing. I know we've talked about it earlier, but if you could just give us a reminder, what's the best way for us to connect and start to, uh, to learn more about what you're doing? Sure. Of course. Uh, I, I'd love to, talk to the listeners and viewers, Billy, I'm happy to share uh, whatever, whatever I can. Uh, but I can be easily reached on my uh, U.S. cell phone. At, uh, I guess it's plus one, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. six, six, one, zero, seven, six, one, eight, nine, four, zero is my, is my direct cell phone sitting right here. And then I do encourage folks to go to our website, uh, bellrosestoragegroup.com. 
And that's where you can find the safe ebook. And you can also register on our investment portal. And our investor portal is where we, uh, we put all of our investment opportunities. Uh, so right now we're about, we're about to close on a, uh, a storage facility down in Georgia. And we have another one coming up after that. So if you're interested in learning more about that upcoming opportunity, uh, register on the portal and you'll get all the uh, information when that becomes available. And that's where we do all of our investor communications. That's where all of our K1s come from. It's where all the distributions are made from. So we've really uh, kind of proud of our team. We've put that in place to, to make it easier for our investors to stay connected with us, which is hugely important because we, we want to communicate and let investors know what's going on. Uh, at every turn so that they can sleep at night. <laughs> all right. There you go. It all comes back down to that, man. It all comes back to that. So <laughs> listen, Tom, I, I want to thank you very much. I really appreciate you investing your time with me and the entire Going Long family, man. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Billy. It's been a pleasure. All right. Perfect. If you give me like 10 seconds, I just want to wrap things up with the Going Long family and then we'll be out of here. So listen, everybody, you know, Tom was talking about it. It's the, it's return on sleep. The things that what do you what do you what do you need help with? Where do you still have gaps? Um, he's also giving you the opportunity to go and find out about the safe method that he that he helps to share and educate with other people. So make sure that you take today's conversation, share it with your friends, share it with your family, and start to talk about the concepts that we've talked about in today's conversation. So while you're doing that, I'm going to be preparing for the very next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day, and thank you very much. <music>